matter on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need. You got the sunny and the rock. Praying for a miracle, thirsty for the living well. Only you can satisfy. The mercy seat now I've tasted it's not hard to see only you can satisfy it's sunny in the rock it's sunny in the rock it's sunny in the rock The spirit is body in the wilderness. You will always satisfy yeah. the sun in the rock, water in the stone, better on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need. You got the sun in the rock. Purpose in your plan, power in the blood, healing in your hands. Started flowing when you said it is done. Everything that is enough, I'm in the rock. Sunny in the rock. Sunny in the rock. Sunny in the rock. Looking. I keep finding, you keep giving, keep providing. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I keep praying, you keep moving. I keep praising, you keep proving. I have all that I need.
Love's creation longs to have the words to say But this joy is mine With a thousand hallelujahs We magnify your name You alone deserve the glory The honor and the praise Lord Jesus, this song is forever I'll see. 
magnify your name you alone deserve the glory the honor and the praise lord jesus this song is forever yours a thousand hallelujahs a thousand more hey praise the lord that was good food eh and uh, well done to the chefs and the cooks for that that was beautiful and just brilliant catching up with different people hearing what the lord's doing and uh hearing your feedback from our first session this morning glad that it stirred your heart it was a stirring time and welcome back to those who are watching online and i uh, hope you're comfy there and you've packed away your covid slippers as we said this morning and you've got your issachar trainers out and you're running around the living room saying we're with you andy we're with you denver we're, we're running in this too remember this is a season of run god speaking over the church run run your best lap yet forgetting what lays behind you know we perceive he's doing a new thing and we're going to be on the front lines ready to be going with that and uh, man there's a lot of ways we could go this afternoon but let's go the way I think the Holy Spirit's leading to say but um, you know we're in an interesting time where I really believe like I said in the first session it was about 11 years ago I wrote this book um, God's blueprint for his church and when I say I wrote books you don't know the miracle that was you really don't it's it's when I wrote breakfast of champions the one let me just give you a little story because it will encourage someone the one thing in my life that I had to deal with with God was my education as in I didn't have one um, and when I left school um, these days when you go to school there's a whole lot of different things that they say you could have a problem with when I went you were thick um, it was that simple um, you either went in that classroom or that classroom and I was in the classroom where they counted eggs it was it's was brilliant it was don't get me wrong it was a lot of fun good social life but we didn't learn much and so when when the Lord called me um, like I said I, I was selling fruit and veg I'd left school at 15 I had a deal with the Lord well I thought I did remember never mistaken the Lord's silence for his agreement I remember when I was in living in New York and I felt God tell me to come back to England. I said, I'll come back to England, but I'll never live in Portsmouth and I'll never pastor. And that's where I mistook his silence for his agreement. Sometimes he just lets you move, gets you where you need to be, and then does what he wants to do anyway. And that's what makes him God. Um, but I had this deal with the Lord. I said, I'll do anything. I'll preach for you. You can have my imagination. You can have my mind. You've got my go. But just don't ever touch my education because it was an embarrassment in my life and then like the Lord normally does in the story of Gideon um, one day I was I was somewhere and uh, I'd been writing these devotions for a football player that was work playing in guitar I was trying to help him navigate God in his life and uh, I've been writing devotions but hardly any spelling it was bad it was really bad people say when they read my stuff before it's corrected it's like reading a dictionary it's just loads of words you know and um, in the middle of it I felt the Lord say to me call yourself an author and I went no Lord we had a deal here we don't go near that area because it was a wine press in my life that I was hiding in. God will never come into your wine press to hurt you, but to bring you into victory. If the Lord's bringing you out of something, a wine press in your life, follow him. He's not trying to ruin you. He's bringing strength and wholeness to that area. This is for someone I wasn't going to share this. And so I said to the Lord, um, that's not funny, Lord. We, we said we'd keep away. He said, yeah, you said you'd keep away from that. Um, and he said, call yourself an author. But then he said, call yourself a published author. I went, all right, this is just getting better by the minute, isn't it? And I said, but Lord, I haven't got a book. He said, Abraham didn't have a child. Next question. Don't argue with God, you know. Um, I went, all right. And so I just started walking around. I'm an author. I'm an author. And people would say to me, what's your book? Well, I haven't got one. <laughs> but I'm an author. I felt just like Abraham, you know. I was like, I've got kids. I'm my motive. I haven't. And then, so I said, all right, Lord, I'm doing this. I'm an author, I'm an author, I'm a published author, I'm an author. And then I said, it'd be kind of useful to have a book, and that terrifies me. He said, you've already written it. And that was Breakfast of Champions 1. I'd been sending these devotions out to one football player, 
And I didn't realise he was sending it. I didn't understand the World Wide Web. He was sending it to businessmen in the Bahamas, all over the place. And the spelling and the punctuation was atrocious. Atrocious. One day I didn't write Breakfast of Champions. and I, got, I was sitting in Bradford in McDonald's. And I got an email from someone that said, Hi, I'm a businessman. And I work with five companies. I send your devotion to them all. Why didn't you write Breakfast this morning? I'm like, who are you? Like, where did you come from? And, and, I said, I said, and he said, and by the way, you might want to repair your grammar. I'm like, thank you very much. So suddenly I'd written these devotions and I felt, God said, so you've got a book. So I had a manuscript and I went, all right. And I said, well, I need someone to help me with this. Now, whenever you step out of your wine press to believe God to do something he says you can do, but you don't think you can, you need to understand that everything is already in orbit. But your faith releases it. Your faith brings it into being. But if you sit there not believing God and walking by faith, without faith it's impossible to please him, you've got to walk by faith. And so I said, okay, so I had this manuscript and I'm like, uh, how are we going to... So I walked into my office and that day a lady had joined the team, volunteer, and I said to her, listen, this is a bit crazy. I said, would you go through this series of words and try and put some sense and turn them into 300 and something devotionals? She smiled, she said, do you know the job I just left? She said, I said, no, she said, I was a professional proofreader. You see, the moment you step out, God can bring in what is positioned to fulfill what he's calling you to do. And so she went through it, and I've suddenly got this now manuscript that you can read. That was not Breakfast of Champions 2, that was Breakfast of Champions 1, which was the first book. And, um, and so suddenly I went, all right, I need a, I need a publisher, because he said published author. So I just randomly picked a, a Christian publisher. And this is, I promise I'm not exaggerating at all. I rang him, I said, can I speak to your, your, your manager? Um, they said, absolutely. And uh, they said, who is it? I said, it's Andy Elms. And, uh, and they said, okay. And suddenly the manager came on. He said, is that Andy Elms? I said, yeah. He said, I was in a meeting that you preached at about eight years ago. And God told me, when this young man writes, publish him. Wow. And, and I'm like, I'm looking for the little camera. Like my, my staff are going to come in and go, ah. We had, I'm like, everything just was just. And then nobody knows when, pub, when that book was published and it was delivered to me the release that came in my life and then I just got writing and I've not stopped since but then I found other pastors that were scared to write so I actually ended up opening a publishing co uh, company to help other pastors public now just stay with me there was a kid that was scared of his education ended up owning a publishing company that helped other pastors to print because I found my God can do anything if you just walk in obedience and faith to what he's speaking uh, that was just extra I hope that encouraged someone so I wrote Blueprint uh, about 11 years ago but I just suddenly realised I've written it for today I look, actually look younger than I do in the photo that's amazing God's so good if you look in the back you're going to say were well, you alright then I mean I, I'm looking great I'm getting younger here this is awesome now when I wrote that it was because we're in a point where we need to get the church back to what God wants it to be focusing on what God wants us to focus on we've come through a lot of years where we've built a lot of sunrooms and conservatives uh, conservatories but sometimes we did it at the cost of building the main building and I really felt 10 years ago but it's like now but God's saying to us get your blueprints off the counter come back to mine because all of us in building modern church laid our ideas of what good church would look like over his sometimes but God's stripping back the other blueprints and he's saying to us concentrate on the things I told you to do it's good now it's brilliant that you've got different flavored muffins and you've worked on your lighting systems God's not against all of that we've got that in family church but those things can't be instead of what God asked us to do when Jesus said I will build my church in the gates of hell Will not prevail against it he had in his mind a church that would change the world not one generation would be unstoppable you would never be able to close it affect it through every generation now we've got to understand that when we're building church church is not the building right church is not a meeting we have buildings we go to meetings church is people now when we're building church in the 2020 wherever we are now what are we 2022 we've got to understand that God is back to building the church which is the people and we've got to understand that there's some things that are non-negotiable to us and need to be non-negotiable 
One of them is, to me, when I look at the blueprint of God for the church, not just 2,000 years ago, because I really believe that we need to be a first century church with a 21st century, you know, we need to be a 21st century church with a first century vision. The DNA of who we are remains the same as the first church that Jesus opened 2,000 years ago. What did they care about? These things gave them the growth that they saw. God liked what he saw and added to their number. I believe that the Lord's causing, now COVID was an interesting season, but actually nothing spirit died in COVID. It was only things sustained by the flesh that died in COVID. And a lot of churches are coming out of COVID days, realising that they were busy in themselves with things that really didn't have much to do with God at all. And they're coming back to things that matter to God. Now, when I look at the blueprint of God, there's a couple of key lines. One of them would be winning the lost. Another one, making disciples. Number three, being led and filled with the Holy Spirit. Those three things are coming back to the forefront of what God wants church to be in this incredible moment that we're in. And we need to have a passion for those three things, greater than ever before. Now, I'm working with church leaders <coughs> across the country, across the world, and coming out of what COVID was, however it affected your gatherings, we all have the same three things in common now. One degree or another, some people focus on one, others on the other. What are we busy doing? Three things, reach, retain, release. Now, I got all of my pastors in one room and I said, I want you to just concentrate on these three things. Forget some of the other stuff that we were doing. I need you to concentrate on these three things. And I made them memorize them, reach, retain, release because the future of who we are and where we're going next is dependent upon how well how well we reach people and how well we retain people and how well we can release people that we've retained into the works of ministry now this is actually just a journey back not a journey to somewhere we haven't been before in all of our genius all we do is find ourselves returning to a blueprint church that was there 2000 years ago that concentrated on these things and had great effect in them everybody with me so again it's that passion let's win the lost i've worked with different pastors even in our own um, group of churches and one of them's brilliant at reaching but they're rubbish at retaining which means they put all their effort into reaching. They get people come through the doors, but no one ever stays. We've got to stop and talk about this. You have a problem with retention. Let's get that fixed so that you keep the people coming through the doors. Another pastor I'll speak to will have a problem with releasing, which means they reach, they retain, but the people are seated comfortably in people's storage units when they were never meant to. And then you help that person to then release. I've got other pastors that I work with, but just a rubbish at reaching people. So they have no one to retain and no one to release. We need to understand, okay, in our lives, where do we struggle? For me, each of my pastors can struggle in a different area. I've got to work out where are they limping, the reach, the retain, or the release. Because if we can get all three of those working correctly, man, we've got an unstoppable church that keeps on recreating itself and multiplying. And we didn't go to a thousand seminars to work out how to do it. We just got back to the Bible and we said, Jesus, what are you passionate about? I want to be a passionate about that too. What's Jesus passionate about today? The lost. Reaching the lost. He's passionate about making disciples and he's passionate about people being filled with the spirit and knowing how to be led by the spirit and empowered by the spirit in their daily lives. And that doesn't matter what denomination you're in. There ain't no denominations in heaven. We, we made, made that, that stuff, stuff up. There's, there's one family, there's, there's one people, there's one uh, community of people that belong to God. So laying that as a platform, I really sense that this is an incredible moment for us to begin to have conversations. How do we build a soul winning church. How do we build a soul winning church? During lockdown, I had a few moments. Um, so I wrote another book, Soul Winner, which was really easy to read because basically I put everything I'd learned about personal evangelism over 30 years into a book and said, read this, you can do it too. I didn't write this for church pastors. I wrote this for church people. Because church pastors have a commitment to reach people. Some of them are okay at it, others are better. But we can't keep doing evangelism like we've done it. Otherwise, we'll keep seeing the same results we've seen. 
we've got to stop and think. We need to see a shift. So reach, retain, release. Let's part retain and release to another time if you ever invite me back, all right? Let's concentrate on reach because this is the most important thing. It's not an optional extra. We've got to be reaching the lost better and faster than we ever have before. And we need to actually be building soul winning churches, not bringing evangelists in. It's a new day. Now, we were all exposed when we say evangelist, you say arena. I say evangelist, you say arena. I say evangelist, you say someone on a stage doing something. I say wrong. Because the model that we've had for evangelism over the last few decades has been effective. But actually, if we quantify our success by soul saved and then retained and made disciples, have we really been that effective or are we patting ourselves on the back too early? Because apparently there's two, there's 7.7 billion people on the earth, according to Google, at any given time. And 2.2 billion people profess to be Christians. Now do the math. If we had 2.2 billion people among a population of 7.7 billion, we'd be in heaven now, right? The problem is we may have 2.2 billion, but we've got 2.2 billion quiet Christians, silent Christians, that don't feel confident to share their relationship, not religion, their relationship with Jesus to other people in their daily worlds. So this is what's been stirring in my heart. I've always been an evangelist since I came back to the Lord at 24. And the evangelist I was, was very much, I was on the stage, I was the one preaching, how many hands could I get put up, give me a photo for my newsletter. That was the type of evangelism that I was busy and successful in. All of a sudden, the Lord started speaking to me about evangelism during COVID, and the evangelist woke up in me, but this time it woke up differently. It had the apostolic attached to it, where suddenly I was looking at evangelism saying, it's not about one man on a stage. It's how can we get as many people that follow Jesus sharing Christ with others? We've got to turn the church inside out. I'm not into any form of church deconstruction. I think that's vile. I think we're not in a time of deconstruction. We're in a time of refinding, repurposing, never deconstructing the church. Who are we to deconstruct the church? It's God's people. But we need to look at how we do things. We need to have good conversations. And so I've been walking along this route of soul winner saying we need a shift in how we understand evangelism in English churches. We've got to move evangelism from the select few to everyone can do it. We've got to train people how to share Jesus with others in a way that's effective and also that they suddenly see that church isn't something they do or attend, it's who they be. So to me, again, we look at this, we talk from the book of Ephesians, don't we, where it speaks of the gifts that Jesus gave to the church. We all know those verses in Ephesians where it says, and he, that's Jesus, gave gifts to the church. These aren't the gifts of the spirit. That's a separate grouping of gifts. They're not the gifts of servitude that we read about in Corinthians. They're five specific gifts that Jesus gives to his church. He gave, he gives, he will continue to give. We call them because we're professional ascension gifts, right? Ascension gifts. But they're different to the gifts of the Spirit. But we need to understand again, I think we misunderstood or settled for a lesser experience of the ascension gift than what we should have. And we need to come back to a truer understanding now that Jesus said he gave some to be, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, you know the, the listing of that. But then what does he say next? Paul says, for the equipping of the saints for works of ministry. That word works is the word ergon, which means to do business. It just means to do business. So when we read it in the light of that, what does it say in Ephesians? Jesus Christ gave us certain ascension gifts, graces upon certain people that he selected to carry them, that carried a grace and an anointing to function apostolically, um, to function as a prophet, to function as an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. But they weren't actually anointed to spend their life on the stage doing all the work. That's what we reduced it to. 
They were actually there, and the primary role was to equip, empower, mobilize, and train every follower of Jesus to be effective in the graces that were the gifts upon the ascension person, right? So again, how fun could church be if we started to go with an original design? I mean, people keep coming up with new designs for marriage, but there's nothing like the original design, is there? It works, you know? There's an original design for the purpose of ascension gifts in the New Testament church. And it isn't the greatest showman anymore. It isn't. It isn't a person being flown in, standing on a stage. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm here, you know. Um, that's what we made it. Now, don't get me wrong. Somebody with an ascension gift can function personally upon the grace that's upon their life. But also, we forgot that bit. But there's a grace on them, there's an anointing, there's a gift of heaven on them to equip and release the grace and teach people to function in a portion of what's on their life. There's a difference between office and we get that. We know that some people sit in an office. But to me, how fun would church be if we reinvented this and said, OK, we want all the prophets now to teach people how to prophesy. As well as being a prophet in their own sense, speaking into national things. There's a lot of non-profit out there. I'm sure you've bumped into them. Uh, people call themselves all manner of stuff. But genuine prophets are brilliant when they're able to speak into a national thing. But what if prophets said, I don't want you to come and watch me anymore. I want, as a prophetic ascension gift in the church, to train you... Paul said that you earnestly deserve the gifts, especially that you would prophesy. Let me teach you how easy it is to prophesy. Let's just de-spook prophecy. Um, okay, you said to me, I have a word. Okay, I close my eyes. What do I see? Oh, I see a greenhouse and I see God saying to you that it's been like you've been in a greenhouse, but you've been watching things, but they've been separated. Something separated you from experiencing them. You could see things happening. You could see things happening, but it was like there was something between you. But you're in a moment where God's removing the glass where it's going to feel like you're outside and the things that you were once disconnected to are going to be up and close. But also know that even though the glass isn't there, there's a shield over your life of protection. You are safe. Again, all I got was a picture. You can wander over, you can wander over here and you can say, ooh, ooh we got, where's that? Where, where, where? Yeah, okay. I look at you and I see a horse. I see a horse. Not as a horse. I see you riding a horse. And the last season of your life has been focusing the horse from going left and right. But now the horse is focused. And in the next two years, you will take the ground that God said that you would take. Because you had to go through a season of getting the horse and the rider into alignment. But now the horse's head is focused on the future. You watch how you accelerate from this moment on. Jumping things that you didn't think you were going to get. That rings true, right? Okay. Um, uh, I mean, this brother has got an incredible ministry um, and it's actually called Eagles, right? Eagles. I see that right now you're in a season where there's another break, a big breaking moment happening where God's taken the success of your yesterday, but it's like you're going through that birth experience for the next level of what he wants you to fly in. And you've known the discomfort in the years of feathers being pulled out before and beaks being broken. So you recognize the season that you're in and God says, you know what's happening. Just relax in what I'm doing because the greater will be in your latter days than your former so so yeah, prophet i could carry i better stop here um but the prophetic is upon someone now that benefited them but what if i turned around and said hey let's talk in church about how you can see god too you can hear him too let's talk about your love language let's hear let's talk about how you hear him how you see him suddenly what we've done is we've taken ministry from a dramatic stage to being functional in the life of the church now we could do that through all of the gifts, but I want to pick on the one which is the evangelist. We're in a new season where we need to deliver the evangelist from being the man of power for the hour. He can still preach on stages, there's still an anointing to do that. But also to be the one that says, can I teach you how easy it is to lead other people to Jesus? Can I teach you? It's so simple. It's really, I know you're scared of it, and I know it seems, it's really easy. And they begin to teach. All right, number one, you're not representing a religion. You're telling someone about a relationship. 
How easy is it? You know, when I'm out having a curry with someone, oh, 10 minutes in, my wife pops in and then my kids with a company. It's the same with Jesus. When you've got a relationship with Jesus, he finds his way into every... We begin to de-spook and normalise things like the Great Commission that honestly terrify people. When people come into church and we say to them, all right, now you're born again, here's the next thing you've got to do. Go ye into all the nations and preach the gospel to every creature. They're going to rightly go, oh, where does someone like me get started with that? Glad you asked. Let's forget about Asia Minor, um, Korea and all the other places. Just for a moment, let's draw a big fat circle on a bit of paper and say that's your bespoke world made up of relationships that are unique to you, that you see every day. Why don't we just, we'll come back to Africa, Asia Minor, let's just concentrate on identifying your world. Because the Bible says first Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, then the ends of the earth. Now I'm sure God will use you all over the planet, but let's just start, let's define your Jerusalem. Does God want you to get on a plane and go to the ancient town of Israel? No, he wants you to begin to tell the people at the school gate the people that work in the local shops. He wants you to see your local world made up of bespoke, unique relationships as your Jerusalem and then invade that Jerusalem by preaching the gospel. Preaching scary. How about we say communicate in your relationship with Jesus Christ to those who are in your unique world? We just made an undoable great commission doable by everyone in about two minutes. We got to be training people. It's every person's responsibility to be sharing Jesus. Do you know, people actually want to. I, was, I wrote the book in, um, in, during COVID and, and churches just started buying it in copies. And we, we'll, I'll do a bulk rate for anyone that's gonna buy some today. But I was sitting there one day in my living room, because we all became savvy with like Zoom and that, didn't we? And I felt, I felt the Lord say to me, all right, you wrote the book, do a boot camp. I'm like, all right, so I just, I turned the camera on, I said, right, I'm going to do a boot camp and I'm going to spend five Wednesday nights, an hour and a half, to train anyone who's interested on how to, how to win others to Jesus. I'm going to talk about the Great Commission, I'm going to talk about how the Holy Spirit helps you, and I'm going to do it over five nights. Come and join me, here's the link. We've done five, and I've had 2,400 households and small groups watch me sit in my living room with my shorts on and a shirt, explaining how easy it is to lead your friends and family to Jesus outside of the building and then bring them in to be a part of a family. We've got to, we've got to talk about this stuff because if we keep doing what we've done, we'll keep seeing what we see. He's going he's gonna to carry you over those hurdles, brother. They look like they're huge. They look like they're big. And sometimes you've said, how am I going to get over them? God says, you're not. I'm going to lift you over. He says, trust me. Just as I've taught you to trust me, trust me, trust me. I'll lift you over those hurdles. You will see yourself on the other side. So we say to God, how do we get started with this stuff? Where, where do we get started? We begin to say, all right, let's have a heart to change what evangelism looks like. Let's call everyone a soul winner, not just a select few people. Let's begin to talk about soul winning in our churches. And so I've done these boot camps and it's been amazing the people that have come through the boot camps with that, which that shows me there's a hunger. People are realising right now, listen, we're not playing games anymore. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken. But what does Hebrews say to us? That it's being shaken to reveal that which can't be shaken, which is God's kingdom. This is a phenomenal moment as everything people trusted in is failing them or shaking. We leave the building and begin to say, let me tell you something that you can build your life on that can never be shaken. We've got the answer, but we've got to let the Holy Spirit, I think, blow some of the fairy dust off of our hearts regarding things we claim to believe. I mean, you say to people, do you believe that people go to heaven and hell? Oh, absolutely. Then why aren't you telling your unsafe friends and family? Because if they die tonight, they're going to a lost eternity. That's fact. Oh, yeah. But it's almost like a disconnect between what we say is true and the effect on their life. 
So it's amazing. The first night that we do in boot camp, and I'll give you, we, if you go to soulwinner.co.uk, that's, uh, there's a site on there called training. I'll give you the details again at the end, where people can sign up. They're free of charge. I don't charge nothing. They can sign up for a boot camp, and um, I, I take them over five nights just through five principles of, of leading. We've had churches. We had one church in Aberdeen, um, Ian Duffy there, um, he bought 300 books and made 300 of his team go through boot camp. And he said, the way that growth is happening in his church now is different. Why? We've let the church out of the building. Because the old unwritten rule was, we make our people bringers, and then you only get 10% that normally do. And the whole success is then bringing someone from their Jerusalem into a church building to hear a message and hopefully they'll pop their hand up at the end. Again, if that model is so successful, why isn't it? If we don't like the results we're getting, we need to look at the recipe we're using. Now, I've been itinerant for 30 years as well as pastoring the churches and leading the churches. And the latter part of being itinerant was pretty good because people put you in hotels. But remember the early days of itinerant, anyone that's been itinerant, it was back bedrooms. Yeah. It was, it was back bedrooms. You stayed with Betty and Norman in their back bedroom, and sometimes that was a great experience. Other times you're like, what are you doing to me, Jesus? What are you pruning? Uh, well, you know, I'm just here to be a blessing. Why is this happening to me? And I can remember traveling around, and Sunday lunch, you always had the traditional roast dinner and an apple pie afterwards. Oh, I had some apple pies that were delicious. But I had some apple pies. The evil would be the right word. It was just like, that is nasty. <laughs> the woman would bring it out of the kitchen and go, I made you my famous Devon apple pie. And I go, oh, great. I'd eat into it. I'd like, oh, God, she's used salt instead of salt. This is not good. But then I'm left in this predicament that I have to represent all evangelists and itinerants. But if I don't say anything they're going to have to experience this beyond me. But if I say something, I'm not going to be popular. But I love people. But the thing is, if I don't say something, all she needs to do is keep using the same ingredients, the same temperature, the same measurements, and the same vessels that she uses. And she can, without doubt, recreate that monster every Sunday without fail and torture people with it. So someone has to say something. When we change the ingredients of something that we do, we can change the flavor of what we do and produce a different result, but you never get different results using the same ingredients. We need to see a shift in how we understand evangelism, from stage evangelism to lifestyle evangelism, where suddenly it's not a few people who are gifted to be evangelists. Look at my business card, it's written evangelist. But rather, everyone is a soul winner. Everyone is a soul winner. Actually, our church experience when we gather won't decrease, it will increase because an excitement comes in the house because you're finally doing something that Jesus likes. His heart is for the lost. But you know, sometimes it's such a simple thing that stops us soul winning. And on the first night of Soul Winner, I always ask this question. I say, before we can go any further, I've got to ask this question. Where does soul winning start? And normally people say prayer. No, I disagree. Because I know loads of people that are praying in closets for revival and people to be winning. But they're not going after the lost themselves. No, it starts with caring. Do we care? But what we talk about is real. But a person has to choose Jesus for their name to be unblotted in the Lamb's book of life. And if their name isn't in that book, they may have been kind, good and nice. They will experience a separation, not for a lifetime, but for all eternity in a place that the Bible only gives us a glimpse in, but the glimpse is terrifying. We've got to let the dust be blown off of our lives as church leaders so that we stop bringing an evangelist in once a year but we begin to say 
Lord, give us the ascension gift of the evangelist in our local home to help us make every person an effective, confident soul winner. We could shift everything if we got that right. So I'm excited that Jesus is saying, listen, concentrate on three things. Reach them, teach them, release them. But it's pointless having plans of retaining if we're not reaching. The ideal for me is we raise up an army of soul winners, but at the same time we raise up an army of disciple makers. And it, I've already kind of moved on from a soul winner project. I've got that plate spinning in the air. Now I'm saying I don't want it to be like it looked like before when they do get saved. We've got to focus on these things that matter to Jesus. Winning the lost, making disciples and releasing people into the good works that God has them to do. Remember, we are God's workmanship created in God for good works. Same word, good works, ergon, to do God's business on the earth. This is so exciting because this season that we've been through called COVID has given us a reset to stop and talk and look at what we're doing and ask, is it working? And not be scared to be like the kid in the story of the uh, emperor's garment where we look at something and everybody's saying it's wonderful, but something in us says, this, it's got nothing on. It's, it's, there's nothing to this. Because then the Lord just brings us back then to being a blueprint church that says, you know, the reason we exist is to see the lost saved, people discipled. Now, even getting people discipled was interesting because, again, the former model was stage centric, wasn't it? That a person put their hand up when they heard the gospel and suddenly somebody came to them, gave them a leaflet and then they were left to die a lot of the time. You know, they didn't make it past birth. How are we going to get, get a better, better strategy? strategy? So, so for, for me, me in family church, church I said, you know what, we're, we're going to do this differently. differently. Just like people, people don't need to come to church to become a Christian, they, they don't need to go into a classroom to be a disciple if we add the key component called relationship. So what we've done now in family church, and it's working, is I've got disciple makers. And so... It's, it's like, like two, two Sundays, Sundays ago, we had nine, nine first-time first salvations, and I was over the moon because I've been seeing it build and build, and, build. and we, we had nine, nine first-time salvations. Salvation. But this was different now because we'd put a system in, we'd stopped and we talked about what was matter, what, what mattered. And, and what, what happened was each of those nine people were assigned a person personally to walk with them for six weeks to help them get through every attack of the enemy, water baptism, and inclusion into a small group. Because we've, we've got, got to stop, stop kidding ourselves that us saying from a stage, don't, don't forget, forget to come to small group on Wednesday, is going to get that person to small group on Wednesday. They need people to walk with them. And so to me, I'm really excited because I'm watching ministry like evangelism, disciple making, move from a stage expression alone to coming into the culture and the lifestyle of people, which means... Our, evangelist, our evangelistic efforts can be ongoing, continual, non-stopping. Where again, we've got to sacrifice some other models that may have worked in the past. We're scared to do that sometimes, aren't we? You know, it's like, to me, I love good street evangelism when it's done well. Bad street evangelism is embarrassing. Some people need to be stopped, not encouraged. I've heard people stand on, on streets and spill nothing but pure judgment and ruin everyone's availability to hear a good gospel. One, I, come on, I've seen great evangelism, street evangelism, where it's been effective. But sometimes when we say evangelism, people go, that means I've got to be a part of a group that meets on Saturday once a month, go out in the high street and watch people go in Primark and out of H&M to avoid me and create a huge circle because they don't want to be in. I do that. There's a guy in Portsmouth. He preaches on the street. I go into Primark and out of H&M to get away from him. And I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. What do normal people do? Because the guy doesn't even know the gospel. What if, right, 
What if? Because I asked a, a street preacher this once, I said, good on you, bold, but here's a thought. If we're not scared to play with some things, what if we took a team of people out on the street, right, on a Saturday afternoon, don't take a megaphone, don't take a camera to film yourself and put on Facebook later, actually spend the afternoon sitting next to people on benches, initiating great conversations that led into telling them who Jesus is to you, would that be more effective? But normally people will respond, well, that's not how Wesley did it. Wesley's not alive today. And this day we're living in is different to the day that Wesley stood in. I'm sorry to break that news to some of you. People today want to talk. They want to communicate. They love to ask questions. So the other thing that we're committed to with Soul Winner also was, um, someone's clicking their fingers there. You're right. <laughs> like, okay, cool, I love that. All right. Within Soul Winner, it was like I'd finished writing the book. I thought I'd finished. And then um, towards the end, I felt the Lord saying, no, you've not finished yet. There's another chapter. And I suddenly realised that if I just said to people, go, 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 go. We could be releasing people on the world that don't even know what the gospel is themselves. So when we look at getting evangelism into the life of the church rather than something we do, we need to be committed to teaching people the fundamental understanding of what salvation is. Because what you send people with, they replicate. So if their understanding is warped towards judgment instead of grace, what they're going to do is become messengers of a gospel that's not quite right. And so I included in the end of uh, Soul Winner 24 key aspects of what you need to understand about salvation. There's more, but we need to be helping our people. Hey, when you get into a conversation, we want you to feel confident to then talk to that person some more, you know, because when somebody leads someone to the Lord, it's amazing how the person that then they look to to help them to understand what happened is that person. So actually, if you're raising soul winners, you can raise people that take care of the first step of your discipleship at the same time. If they understand the gospel, what it is to be born again, what is the new creation, how does justification work, how are we perfected yet being made perfect. These key aspects, we've got to understand that we're not just standing on a stage going, right, I want you all winning souls now and preaching the gospel to your friends. But we're building an excitement in church about soul winning. We're talking about it. Has anyone been telling their friends about the Lord? We make it cultural so it becomes a part of who we are, just like it was a part of the early church. And uh, I love that story um, where, I think it was Joab, wasn't it? Joab wanted to get a message to David about uh, his son Absalom, but also how the war was going on. And he said, I need to get a message to David. And the, this little kid, as a hair or somewhere his name, he, he, he said, I'll run, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. And, and, uh, and, David, and uh, Joab says, not you, not this time. And he sends his Cushite, who was older, fatter. Um, and he sends his Cushite, and his Cushite starts plodding along to tell David the good news, the message. But the young kid carries on, me too, me too, me too, I'll go, I'll go. And in the end, I think Joab did it to get rid of him. He went, run, just go. Get away from me. And so the young kid overtakes the Cushite, who's a little fatter, a little slower, gets to David, and David says, what's the good news? What's the message? He went, I don't know. I kind of know half of it. And then David, you can see him roll his eyes, and then suddenly along come the panting, fatter Cushite, who said, this is everything you need to know. If we're going to raise soul winners in the church apart from us, We've got to be ready to bring an excitement of soul winning back into the house. Not make it a, f a thing that a few people do, but something everyone has an obligation and a responsibility to. But also be equipping people to understand what they believe so that when we do send them, they're carrying the right message, right? And uh, it's exciting. It's like Christianity, it's really kind of weird when you put it against all the worldwide false religions. Because every other religion... You work your whole life to get something at the end. Christianity, you get everything you're ever going to get the, morning, the moment you believe and you spend out the rest of your life working out what you got. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's genius. The moment a person's born again, he, they receive everything 
that God's ever... But they spend the rest of their life working out what they got. The sad thing is I many, meet many Christians who have been walking with him for 30 years and they've never discovered what they got in that moment they believed. They've never understood the new creation, the freedom. We want to become experts in the gospel that we preach, the good news that we preach. And I just really think that this is super timely because we're in a moment where the world doesn't need us to give it good entertainment. We need it, it needs us to give them answers. We're in a moment where things that other people trusted in have fallen. They no longer have the security. And they're looking for something to build their life on that's solid. That's not something, that's someone. We have all the answers. It's amazing. In Soul Winner, some of the stuff we, we cover is really simple, but it's needed. People often ask me this question, because we normally do 40 minutes teaching, and then I have live questions and answers. And commonly, somebody will say, what if somebody asks me a question and I don't know the answer? I said, it's simple. Stay with me. You say, I don't know. And they're like, really? I said, yeah, yeah. You just go, I don't know. I'll ask my pastor. But this I do know. This Jesus I'm telling you about changed my life. Let me tell you how he changed my life. It's not rocket science. It's getting back to some of the foundational stones that our fathers laid of every person knowing their testimony. Because when we go out to share our faith with people in our Jerusalem, we're not having an argument. We're not out to win arguments. We're out to win people. And it's like, hey, I grew up in a Pentecostal church singing this song, but I only realised what it meant now. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We all sung that, didn't we? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, praise the Lord. And I used to sit in the back as a kid going, every time it got to a bit, let the redeemed of the Lord, me and my mates would shout, so really irritated the pastor, Archie Biddle. <laughs> really irritated Archie Biddle. Really did. But it was recently while revisiting Soul Winner, I went, let the redeemed, those who have been redeemed from the hand of the enemy, say so. So I looked through other translations let those who have been redeemed from the enemy's hand tell their story to others. If we turn the church inside out, we can hasten the coming of Christ really quick and we can all just get out of this place because it's fallen to bits and be where we're meant to be, right? Some of you want to stay here. You stay here, I'm off. Now, yeah, yeah, she's coming with me. So, you know, it's what Keith Green used to say. If God spent, what was it, six days making this and he's been gone 2,000 years, this place is a garbage can. You know, it's, it's, this is real. But I just want to challenge you with that session. If you're here today, if you're watching online, soul winning isn't something that a few people do. Soul winning isn't something that we add to our list of things we may need. Soul winning is vitally important. But we've got to revisit Ephesians Ascension Gift Ministry and understand it's not about a few people carrying a business card or calling themselves something. It's them releasing the grace of that Ascension Gift that's on their life into the working life and the lifestyle of everyone who's a follower of Jesus. Does that make them a prophet as in the office of a prophet? No, it doesn't but it gets them functioning in the gift of prophecy, which is for the benefit of all. But all of those, imagine if we had churches that came out of COVID and went, well, actually, everyone does a bit of apostolic here, because apostolic is the sending of people. Everybody's busy sending people. Everybody's pastoring. Oh, the pastor's dealing with the ones that nobody else wants to touch, but in our culture, everyone's doing an element of pastoring because the pastor taught them how to. Everyone's a soul winner because the evangelist is training people to be soul winners. Everybody can teach the word because they're being taught how to understand the word, interpret the word, rightly divide the word and communicate it to others. Imagine if we let ministry leave the stages. I actually think we need to apologise to the stage because we were asking and expecting far too much from it. Stuff that it could never give. Because the whole purpose of Jesus in the Blueprint Church 
was he said to anyone, come and follow me and I will make you. We've got to get our people checking out of Christianity that takes a Sunday to be included in, to saying, this is my life. He's my saviour. I walk with him every day. I can't stop telling other people. It's like we do a, a whole chapter in Soul Winner and we just answer some really basic questions. Another question that people commonly asked me was this one. Um, apart from you know, some of the more complicated theological ones. It was, <clears throat> I know I've got to do it, but I just can't get into conversation. And that became the roadblock that stopped a person having a conversation about someone they knew. So I said, well, let's just remove the roadblock. And I realised that what most of us were taught evangelistically growing up was there was almost one size fits all, that you go up to an unsuspecting person that doesn't see you coming and you say, if you die tonight, are you going to heaven or hell? Um, it's not good, is it? Now, it was funny, I went into a hospital and I actually used that one the other day. Uh, two weeks ago, I was called into a hospital. 10 days ago, late at night, and my uncle was dying. He'd rejected Christ for about 50, 60 years. And, uh, and that was a moment I could use that because the nurses told me he'd be gone by the end of the night. So it was, it was quite funny looking back. I kind of turned up and I've not seen him for like 30 years. And he's laying on the bed, he's dying. I said, oi, you know me? And he said, yeah, it's Andy. I said, all right, you know you're going to go to heaven or hell by the end of the night, right? You know that. And I need you to go to heaven. Are you ready to receive Christ? I know my mum told you about him. Are you ready? And he went, I'm ready. I said, right, pray after me. <laughs> and, 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 and he prayed, because they told me he wouldn't be there by the end of the night. So I'm like, this hasn't got time attached to it. And the nurse is standing there. She's laughing. She was one of my Filipino nurses. She's going, that's my pastor. And I'm like, right, right now, pray after me. Now, you understand that prayer? Nod it. I said, all right. You say, I said, also be filled with the Holy Spirit as well, because we want you to have everything, even though you're going to be seeing Jesus in a few moments. I said, I actually said to him, listen, when you get to heaven, give my mum a hug, all right? You're going to be seeing her by tomorrow morning, so give my mum a hug as well. And, and she was like, and goes, he was going and he knew it. So I prayed, I said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. He left hospital yesterday and went home fully restored. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't get that, because he was dead that I've ever seen dead before in my life. The guy was out of here. His daughter, my cousin, rang me and said, they're sending dad home. He's, he's put on all his weight and he's able to look after it. I'm like, wow, thank goodness I prayed the Holy Spirit prayer afterwards. Otherwise, you'd like be in heaven. That's awesome. But, you know, God didn't finish him. So I'm going to go and disciple him now. I'm going to always oh, thief on the cross. You didn't go. Let's talk about your walk with Jesus now. But that's like... When I was, in, I was backslidden wickedly from, uh, for eight years, if somebody came in to me and said, do you know where you're going to go if you die tonight? To me, that was pub talk. That was the same as pick a window you're leaving. <laughs> to which I always answered, pick another one, I'm coming back. Uh, but that's a different story. But I said, why don't you try different things? You, no one says you have to say, are you going to hell tonight? And so what I've done, we, 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 someone last night, weren't we, Denver? And they came out and I said, hey, listen, we're having a discussion. You need to answer this for me. Would you give me your honest answer? And the guy was great, wasn't he, Denver? He said, he said, he said yeah. I said, no, you've got to tell me your honest answer because we're having a discussion here. And we weren't. I was lying. And, um, but it was for a good cause. And um, I said, well, answer this question for me. I said, because it will really help us. And he said, yeah, absolutely. I said, who do you say Jesus was? He said, what? I said, no, seriously. I said, a lot of people say that this Jesus was, was uh, who do you say Jesus was? And he said, no, he was just a good guy. I said, but why do people still talk about him 2000? And we got into this conversation where the guy committed to go home and pray, if you're real God. He said he was an atheist, basically. If you're real God, prove it to me. God will answer that sort of prayer. I got into the conversation I wanted to get into, but it wasn't abrasive. I didn't preach in the guy's face. I used the art of communication to get me where I wanted to be. It's like when I'm sitting outside waiting for my wife in the shops, I'll sit next to somebody on a bench. It's not street evangelism as you knew it. But I'll sit next to him and uh, I'll go, oh, you're all right, yeah. You have a good weekend, what you get up to? And they'll tell me, and I've actually made them obliged now to ask me what I did at the weekend. Because we're British, right? And sure enough, I let them dribble on about what they did. And then they go, how about you? Oh, 
interesting. Actually, I went to church. Do you go to church? And I'm in the conversation. Again, it's just like so simple. We've got to take the fear out of evangelism to our people. Help them to understand how wonderfully normal and easy it is. Teach them correctly what they believe. And then light their tails and get them out there. Oh, but that could cause some trouble. I'm ready for trouble. I'm, I'd, rather, I'd rather calm a wild donkey. Than, uh, I'd rather tame a wild horse than raise a dead donkey. I'm tired, of, I'm tired of people's complaints being Christians that haven't got enough to do. I want some people to ring me. Your people upset? Oh, that's awesome. Your person started telling me about Jesus. Oh, that's brilliant. I want to get into some trouble. Because remember in the Bible, when they went out communicating the gospel, they said, oh no, these people that have turned the world upside down, now they're here. The problem is we made that about now they're here and it was a building, a time, a meeting during the week. What happens when here becomes their world? So I want to encourage you guys, um, get a copy of Soul Winner. Seriously. If you honestly can't afford one, Seriously, don't, don't play games with me. If, if you like McDonald's, Andy's book, Mandy's, no, 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 no. But if you honestly can't afford one, I'll give you one. All right? I'll give you one. Free. You have one. Because I want you to really get your heart tuned in. So if you honestly can't afford one, but you want one, come and tap me on the shoulder. I'll, I'll gift it to you myself. I'll pay for it myself, all right? But if you can pay for one, and, you, and I want to encourage you, get one. Get some for your church. If you buy more than 10 for your church, I'll give you 20% off. All right? Um, get your hands on it, but begin to give it to some significant people who you know are your evangelists. And some of them are barely saved right now. And they're the best evangelists. They really are. It's like the Christians that have been walking with God 40 years don't tell no one, have an intention to tell no one. Then you get somebody, it's like my cousin, she, she, she came back to God and God lit her up. She's a hairdresser. She gives out 30 tracks a week as she's cutting. She's just, the girl's ferocious, but no one told her that you weren't meant to do that. <laughs> and I'm not telling her, I'm like, don't tell her. Let's let her think that's normal because it actually is. We're coming back to join her. We don't want her to join us where we ended up, all right? So I want to encourage you, Soul Winner, um, if you want to sign up, get your whole churches signed up. Soul Winner, it's free. I mean, my goodness, what more do you want? It's free. Soulwinner.co.uk is the website. There's a, a page on there called training, soulwinner.co.uk uh, training. And there's two boot camps starting. One starts in June, one starts in October. It's me in my living room talking to you like this about how easy it is for you to win people to Jesus.